buenos días a todas las personas que nos acompañan aquí en sala en este segundo día de actividades. Thank de you la... for being with us in the second day of the Inter-American Conference for Social Security 2024. We are about to start and today we are going to have Dean Rodrigo Arias Camacho from the National University for Remote Studies in Costa Rica. He has the floor, so he is going to give us some message. Good morning. My regards to all the participants in today's activities. Uh, now that we are celebrating this the week of social security. Regards from the remote university in Costa Rica. Regards to all the people and participants in these activities that address different issues regarding modern societies. We cannot design current societies without considering development and contribu contribu contributions that different parts of social security have contributed in order to reach the current status for co-living together in all the countries. That's why it's so important to spend some time to experience, to share experiences and concerns before the challenges and the developments that every country have regarding social security, not only in access to health, but also in well-being conditions that are indispensable so every individual can have a comprehensive development as human being and uh, accomplish a good living status during his life. So that's why it's so important to share our experiences, our concerns, our expectations during these days around social security matters. On behalf of UNEC and SIGDE specifically, we are proud to be part of this event and to share with you the different results of several research that we have carried out with different populations. Uh, and hopefully all the expectations of the organization for this conference are going to be fulfilled. Regards from Cuesta, Costa Rica. Thank you so much, Dean. And this is the I am the technical and uh, legal assistant from the CIS. Maria Teresa Gonzalez Brando Perez Gonzalez is with me. Oscar Durian Guzman, under director of Liaison and Memberships Attention, and uh, different representatives of the CIS membership are here with us. Dr. Monsalve from the Colombian University. Dr. Ruben. Moya from Bolivia, Dr. Pedro Alcantara from the National Council of Social Security in Dominican Republic. Republic. We all send you our regards. Good morning to all the participants that are with us here and in and remotely. Specifically, I would like to send my regards to all the uh, academic staff. Uh, it's a great honor for us to have you here inaugurating the uh, this conference. And I would like to send my regards on behalf of the chair of this conference, Mr. Acedo Agurto, who is also director of Social Security Institute and from our general director, Alvaro Belarca Hernandez. For CIS, social security is a phenomenon that should be addressed 
by multiple sectors and based in this bylaws of our conference we have opened this to higher studies so it is great to listen to you in the next four days to identify priorities that academia has regarding social security matters and personally i would like to share to all the participants participants that UNEC is the most recent membership. After several months, we have uh, designed our route for collaboration and they are going to take part in this week and we are going to collaborate with them in the first Health Congress and Security in Workplace that is going to be carried out 7 and 8 of May 2024 to analyze trends and channels of work risk together with the Inter-American Conference to Prevent Risk in the Workplace. It is an honor to uh, broadcast all this conference uh, that had to do with child, youth, and old age in order to accomplish social peace in Costa Rica. We wish you the best of success in your activities. And you know that CIS is going to uh, echo all your activities in your in this continent. Pura vida, and thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Dean and advisor. Let's start with the first panel for uh, social security research. But before that, let me remind you that all the uh, discussions are going to be available both in English and in Spanish. There is an interpretation component that you can have access to. This is a reminder to participants in via Zoom. If they have an 80% of assistance, they will receive a certificate of participation. In the YouTube channel from ASSIS, you can follow up all the activities that we are celebrating to uh, carry out the Wake for Social Security services. The membership from other academias are going to share their studies and research. Uh, we are going to have the presentation from Costa Rica, challenges for social security matters. Andres Badilla from the remote university is going to give us a presentation and we would like to thank you for that. Uh, the characterization of the social economic matters that uh, are part of the Costa Rican challenge are very important. Costa Rica has a political stability and is facing serial, a series of complexities that reflects trends and dilemmas that are present in all the region. Exploring these challenges will allow us to understand the specific situation of Costa Rica and is going to give us an opportunity to analyze common patterns and differences in, the con uh, um, in this continent. Analyzing difficulties that Costa Rica is facing is going to give us lessons and perspectives to strengthen the, co the Latin American cooperation in order to have balance and e equitative balance in the social security matters. Andrea Solano, uh, he is a researcher and a teacher in the Center of Investigation of Intercultura in the remote university since 2009. He has published different papers related with the system for social security in the academia and in the scientific environment in Costa Rica and in other parts of the world. He has been a lecturer in different conferences, in different means with activities for public debate. Currently, he is the coordinator of research characterizing cost of medications in Costa Rica, MBA by political science by the University of Costa Rica, a master's degree in Latin American studies emphasizing development and culture and uh, he was appointed magna cum laude by this university. Currently, he is a PhD student of social studies by the UNED in Spain. Andre, you have the floor. Thank you. 
Good morning. It is a pleasure for me to send my regards from Costa Rica. I would like to thank you for having for the opportunity to share with you these studies that we have been carried out since 10 years ago in this university and that had, are related with social security aspects. I have a, a, a short dissertation with me that I am going to share with you, and it's about uh, current challenges for social security in Costa Rica. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you so much. When we talk about the current challenges in social security, we are not to only talking about challenges, but opportunities as well. This is the table of content from this research. First, I would like to give you uh, some guidelines about the contributive system that was designed for a finance sustainability. We have several challenges. Of course, there are more, but because uh, we have to give you a summary. I focus on the ones that I think are the two main challenges in Costa Rica. First, the work, the labor market, and secondly, the state debt. And then I would like to share with you some ideas that I think are going to be the greatest challenge of social security, not only in my country, but at a regional level that are related with migration and climate change. And I am going to talk also about some ideas that are part of the research in Costa Rica. And to wrap up, I'm going to give you a general conclusion. So without further ado, let me tell you why I decided to design the architecture for this uh, contributive system in Costa Rica. As you can see in this slide, let me see if I can give you a better view with a PDF. Just a moment, please. Once again, I am going to share my screen. I think this is better. As I was telling you, I would like to start by talking about the contributed system in Costa Rica that currently is based on the three-part contribution system that receives contributions from three main sectors, the labor, the workers, and the um, employers and the SNAP. If we analyze state contribution, we realize that state contribution is also a three-party contribution. Uh, contribution is three parties when the state is in Costa Rica has to carry out also different concepts. They have to contribute as a state and they have to contribute to social security for those populations that have uh, that receive money from the state. That special population are ch children and youth and inmates. And the state is also an employer. So in that sense, the state should have enough resources to face the responsibility, the all the contributions that they need to pay for social security. Sorry, I don't know if you can see the slide, but what 
determines if the state has or not enough resources to face this social security situation. Well, it depends on the national budget. And the national budget depends on taxing, of course, but also on the job market. Both workers and employers depend on the degree of formalization they have on the job market. So to cap things up, the Costa Rican state receives a contribution from the tripartite model. However, the state itself must perform a tripartite contribution as state, as employer, and for those who are insured by the state. So it is dependent on a strong budget that allows for this type of contribution. At the same time, workers and employers are dependent on the formalization level of the job market in Costa Rica. However, there's a series of indicators that seem to indicate that there's a weakening of the job market in Costa Rica, which generates pressure for social security. So as a starting point, I provide you five large challenges, which I believe are the largest related to social security. First and foremost, it has to do with the Costa Rican job market. I consider that the job market is the first challenge because the job market is the first way of social security. Sometimes we forget that social security has several pillars and the first of them is the job market then we have the pensions and retirement system then the health system and education and then we have the national policies for health care and care overall so in costa rica to have ordinary health services by the trust of the health ministry you need to have a formal job you need to be economically active, formally speaking. So despite the Costa Rican system aims to be universal in its service rendition, in practice, there are different populations that are excluded from the ordinary access to healthcare. They have access to emergency healthcare, everyone does. But if you do not contribute to Social Security, then you are charged correspondingly. However, there are other conditions regarding the formal job market that are forms of exclusion to those populations to ordinary healthcare. As I mentioned, the degree of formalization is really important to have access to Social Security. So if I'm unemployed or if I work informally, or if I'm a migrant with irregular condition, then those type of persons don't have access to healthcare. And when they have non-emergencies, they need to spend out of pocket to receive healthcare. So the formalization of the job market is really important as a condition to access social security and apart from that it allows to question if the provision is truly universal because i believe it is almost universal and it is not providing a universal service in the way we conceive it for everyone who lives within the territory thirdly when we have a vulnerable job market to the external factors such as the subprime mortgage crisis or the recent COVID-19 pandemic that negatively affect the Costa Rican job market, there's a reduction of taxes through contributions of the formal job market. And the job posts are also diminishing. And there's a moment where there's needs in attention in healthcare, and that increases the pressure to provide the services. Another argument as 
the pers as this pers for this perspective is related to automation due to art artificial intelligence in Latin America. Also, I would like to highlight that the Costa Rican job market is really vulnerable to external impacts. We saw it with the COVID-19 pandemic and the feeling and deceleration of the Costa Rican job market. Remember that an important percentage of the exports for, for Costa Rica are sent to the US. So we are vulnerable to the global financial crisis and the changes in the commodities market as in the case of Costa Rica, coffee, banana, and other exports. So taking into account these elements, I provide some indicators that provide us a glimpse of the current just Costa Rican job market. Firstly, we have this graph. This is the unemployment rate that we have currently in Costa Rica. The last strikes data we have for the 2010-2023 period, this is the latest trend. And as you can see, we have an increasing trend. But what we see is that unemployment in Costa Rica has been relatively stable, around 10% of the job force. In 2020, you see this spike in the unemployment rate. It pretty much doubled the rate from 10 to 24% in 2020 Q2, and it has been decreasing. However, for the study period, we see a growing trend on unemployment, and this is around 10% of the job force. Here, we see on blue the percentage of the population without employment. On orange, we have the broadened unemployment that is those who, after looking for a job, stop looking anymore. And on gray, we have the combined unemployment plus sub employment. In Costa Rica, we understand sub employment as those who could work full-time, but they are working part-time. The information I want to convey to you is the trends of unemployment, subemployment, and broadened unemployment. So we have pretty much doubled the amount of people who can be part of the Costa Rican job market and contributing to the social security of the country. But if we add to this figure, those who could have full-time jobs, then we see that this figure goes to almost 40%. And this is a negative impact for Social Security, because as we saw in architecture for the contribution system and the Costa Rican Social Security system, it is highly dependent on the contributions performed by the market that is the job, the formal job market. And this has an impact on the budget of the whole country to face all of its contributions. So in other words, the Costa Rican job market is trending towards precarization and we can thus expect an impact not only on the social security system and contributions, but also on the fiscal health and tax burden. So not only do we have a trend that's negative on unemployment and subemployment, but in this chart, we also have the trend for the last 13 years towards informality. Informality in Costa Rica has been maintained around 40% of the workforce over the last queues, it was slightly reduced, but the average has been around for the job force. And this is truly important for the Costa Rican 
social security because for this country the definition of social security is those who are not contributing to social security because they are not part of any registry of property or they don't have formal accountability or accounting sorry so we need to clear something up maybe someone who is part of the informal job market contributes to the social security through insurance as freelancers so this trend may have a variance with respect to the independent workers however if we sum the data that's obtained by the most recent data of unemployment and informality the most optimist figure is around 50 percent of the costa rican job market does not contribute to social security due to unemployment or informality and this has a deep impact on social security for the country because as we are highly dependent of the formal contributions there is an effect of the contributions and income and this generates a larger burden on the state who constitutionally needs to have enough money to have this system run both in pensions and in healthcare. So in this regard, the main trends on the Costa Rican job market, unemployment, informality, and subemployment talk about the scenario of high effects. And it also talks about something else. For instance, the inability of the state to generate a policy that's strong enough to reactivate the formal job market with high formality. Also, I would like to bring this to the conclusions. We we'll need to think about challenging the idea of the current Costa Rican system. We can add to this the risks of automation. And by that, what I mean is, for instance, the case of robots and AI and automated production systems. Oh yes, I forgot about this chart. Here, I performed an exercise about the amount of hours worked and the productivity for the countries of American OECD countries. On the left, we have the countries. We have Latin American OECD members. Here we have Mexico, Costa Rica, Chile, and Colombia. And I compare this to Spain and to the US. Both Mexico, Colombia, and Costa Rica are the countries where you work the most per year. We work 200 hours more than on the US, and the average is 300 hours more than in Spain. However, when I look at the reason why we see the average productivity per hour, and what we can see is that if we compare the amount of hours versus the wealth that is produced per hour, what we see is that the US produces pretty much three times more wealth per hour worked than in Costa Rica. In Spain, the amount is double, and the difference between Mexico, Colombia, and Costa Rica are a minimum, but we are on the limit of worked hours. And as you can see on the Gini index on the right, what we see is that this does not translate to an improvement of living conditions for the common folk. So it seems like working a lot, it's not the answer that we need to to make up for the amount of employment. I don't mean to say that the amount of job vacancies is not important. It is important, but it is not the only thing that matters. It needs to be formal job markets for the system and it needs to be highly productive. Now, I would like to see the examples related to the risks due to automation. 
here we have the percentage of workers with high risk for the Latin American region. There is a trend, and this is a, a study of the Inter-American Development Bank for automation in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we see the trends for Costa Rica are really, really endangered by precarization. We have high unemployment and high informality. And apart from that, we need to see the risks that we are experiencing by the appearance of automated production systems, such as AI, such as robot implementations, or machine learning. And on red, we see Costa Rica. And the trend is really common for Central America. We have a regional trend of 70% of those who are working high are in high risk of being displaced by or replaced by automation. Then, depending in, with this statistic, we have an OECD study of job creation and local economic development for 2020. And here we have this quote that says around 14% of employments on the OECD zone altogether are on risk to be automated, whereas 32% is likely to experience important changes. This is to say that robots and AI are here to stay and they are transforming the Costa Rican job market. And the question I make is, are we ready to generate a, or reactivate or boost new sources of employment according to the new challenges that we are living in our region due to automation. I am not so optimist in this regard. I believe it is a risk that we need to consider from the perspective of social security to contain the adverse effects of automation. And this leads me to the first summary. The Costa Rican job market is truly important for the social security system in Costa Rica because of the current architecture of Costa Rican financing system is highly dependent on the formal job market conditions, which as you see are not being fulfilled in Costa Rica as for a while ago. It was originally created as a system for all life employment with increasing wages, but the trends talk about high informality, low productivity per worked hour, high unemployment. We saw it on the statistics of unemployment and underemployment. And apart from that, we need to add the first wave of the risks of automation that we are living in our country. So in other words, we have this first big challenge for the Costa Rican job social security system because it explained the automation risk of the system for social security. And apart from that, it also creates other new problems for the system in Costa Rica that are related to the domestic budget and the way we bring funds to it. So in more simple words, on the tax point of view, we need enough resources to face all the needs of social security that the population has. And this brings me to the second issue of today, which is the second challenge, which is the state debt and the fiscal crisis. In this regard, I bring to you four main departure points. The first one is that the Costa Rican state is facing a fiscal consolidation process that's been lasting decades. And the most recent example is a new law that was acted in 2019, and it implements a fiscal rule due to the criticality of the Costa Rican state that was experienced after 2008. This is the first point of departure. Costa Rica is currently going through fiscal consolidation. So please bear that idea in mind because we will go back to it in a minute. Secondly, the state created responsibility through law 
and also through broadening the coverage to given pop populations without economic content. So this means that the state assumed their responsibility to gain new responsibilities, but it did not create the budgets so that the public institutions in charge of supplying the social security services can face the situation. And this brings us to the third point. As the state has a responsibility with social security due to the contributions it has to do, this economic content has translated into debt that Costa Rica has to social security. And as a fourth, we have this debt and we have and the state has done partial payments. But upon doing so, the state has not created mechanisms that correct and guarantee the income that allowed to face the responsibility. We will see each topic in detail in brief. Now we have a brief timeline of the origin of debt. At the beginning of the 1990s, we had two important issues to understand the debt of the state to Costa Rican Social Security. On 93, we saw the creating the law 73-74. This was a law to create a hospital, San Rafael de la Juana. In that law, in Article 5 of that law, their responsibility was created for the state towards those who are living on the street so that they can access ordinary attention on the social security institution. So uh, from this law, we have the state contributing on a population who is vulnerable, in this case, those in strict conditions. Then we have in 95 a reform of the healthcare system where we move the responsibility who was part of the Ministry of Health towards the Social Security institution. So despite of this, the state does not provide enough resources to Social Security institution of Costa Rica to provide for this situation. And these are the important points to understand the origin of that of the state to the institution, to the fund. So we have been paying partially as a state due to the 73-74 law, but the state is still not paying to the fund what it owes for the responsibility of primary health care. And this debt has been accumulating on to this point. In 2008, we have an external crash, which is the subprime mortgage crisis. And the response of the Costa Rican government was a shield. And it led to different decisions that on the short term tried to con the adverse effects, but on the long term, it created a fiscal crisis that has been lagging on as of 2008 to this day. And in 2019, we have yet another external impact for Social Security in Costa Rica due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a brief timeline of the stat debt due to a series of decisions that were taken in the 1990s with new responsibilities, without economic backing, and without the necessary funds to face the needs. And then we have two external impacts, one in 2008 and one in 2019, that have seriously impacted on the Costa Rican healthcare system. And they call for greater services. For instance, in 2019, due to the pandemic, social security in Costa Rica was the first line of attention to the effects so on the pandemic. So taking this in mind, here we have the financial deficit as a percentage of the GDP 
for 20, for the 2000 to 2020 stage. Do you see that for the year 2000 to 2018, we have a super rapid financial situation, but as of 2008, we have a decline of the primary deficit of the Costa Rican state. And this is due to the external impact that's produced by the subprime mortgage crisis. And what I want to show to you with this chart is that how is it possible that the state brings a debt since the 1990 with a superabit up to the moment that it was unsustainable due to external factors. So I would like to answer briefly this question. So why is it relevant to talk about the 2008 crisis for the debt of the state to social security? First of all, it is the origin of the fiscal crisis of Costa Rica, which provides two simultaneous crises. One, where the state needs to consolidate to contain the growth of debt. And the other one is it starts carrying debt to the social security from the early 1990s and over 35 years. So it is important to see this simultaneity of crisis, the fiscal crisis and the sustainability crisis for social security. So during recessions, meaning external negative impacts, for instance, a global crisis or a pandemic. During a recession, during the critical stage due to global crisis or a pandemic or, or climate change, the expenditure goes up because there is a greater need in health. But the income through quotes, uh, that is through the job, formal job market and the national budget trend to be reduced. It's and have a negative impact on the job market. So there is a diminishing income due to taxing because the job market is impacted both domestically and the export. Costa Rica is highly dependent on the tourism and export industries. And with COVID-19, we have a huge reduction of tourism and the profits that we were receiving due to, for instance, tourism. In the year 2009, we noticed that in Costa Rica, we have a decrease in foreign direct investment, remittances, and also construction was stagnated due to the echo of the real estate crisis in our country. So with all of this, we can see that the Costa Rican system is vulnerable vis-a-vis uh, -vis external impacts. So we experienced that during the 70s due to the sovereign and uh, oil crisis. So we can see that there is a BISO cycle. The public debt that we have noticed is not accounting debt with social security. Uh, recently, the debt of the amount by the state of Costa Rica is around 3.7 billion colons. So, uh, to have an idea, is around 6% of the GDP in Costa Rica. So this is what the state of Costa Rica is owing to social security services. So that's why the superavit since the 90s till 2007 have been positive because they were removing from the accounting of the debt. They were not considering the debt of the state with social security. If they uh, took into account that debt, pretty sure the debt of the state would be double. So it would be a debt of around eight or 6% till 12%. So that's why we have more tax pressure before external 
and critical scenarios, as I mentioned before, with the pandemic and more tax pressure uh, due to the lack of formality of the employment environment in Costa Rica. So we see a close relationship between uh, the work labor towards precarization and the tax system. And there is a close relationship between the tax system and the fund of social security and the current system of contributions because it depends in of conditions that haven't occurred in costa rica from decades ago becoming increasingly works are or jobs are informal and we don't have an increase in salaries and this has an impact not only in social security but also in the taxes in the fiscal system of the costa rican system so as a recap, let me tell you that indicators about tax uh, held were accomplished by uh, sacrificing social investment. But we need to carry out more research in order to answer to all these hypotheses. Another trend. There were assignation of responsibilities without economic content that recently have increased the state debt with social security. Therefore, and we saw this in the case of the piece of act 7374 in the year 74, and the contribution for primary health. Thirdly, I think that we have uh, financing conditions of social security that are not related with their real uh, labor work in Costa Rica, because as you saw, it is very informal and is highly dependent on the conditions of the formalization of the job market. So increasingly, we see the precarization of the uh, job market and increasing fiscal problem that uh, Costa Rica has suffered from different decades. So maybe uh, we need to pay more, more attention and make re more research about other alternatives for the architecture of the contributed system. So I think that we need to think about other ways to finance social security that are more appropriate, that are in alignment with the current job situation. When you analyze social security, you can realize that there are two main trends, um, the load over the payroll or contributions by general taxes. And I am not saying which one is better or worse. Each one of them have different scopes and different li limitations and obstacles and areas of, opportuni of opportunities. But we can think about another way of contributions. In Costa Rica, there are populations that are not having access to social security for uh, migration status, uh, for the informality in the job market or unemployment and these are ways for excluding people from social security and they are not given the necessary right from the human rights perspective because we all contribute to the well-being of our population so this is just Food for thought, and maybe you can think about that because I don't know what is the response for the state, but this is a concern that I have had for several years. If the current contribution system in Costa Rica is the most appropriate one for the current situations of the job market in Costa Rica, this is a concern that I have. And now I would like to talk about another challenge that I haven't analyzed as much, but I would like to present to you some arguments that I think that it's the next a great challenge of social security. And this has to do with migration and climate change. 
But before that, let me tell you that uh, during the first two challenges, we noticed that the Costa Rican uh, contribution system it has an infrastructure that depends highly from taxes. But there is another uh, set of indicators that allow us to challenge that architecture because I think it, that is not related with the current job situations in Costa Rica. And we see the relationship between the job market in Costa Rica and the fiscal crisis and its impact on the social security in Costa Rica. And now I would like to focus on an area that it's very interesting for me. I am going to present to you four main arguments first climate change. In Central America, this region, according to the most recent statistics, statistics, Central American region is one of the most regions that is going to be severely impacted by climate change. And we are experiencing that. We know, we have noticed the Nino phenomena and the high waves of heat that are going to have an impact in the following situations. We have more migration pressures because there is an increase in temperature. Uh, there, uh, there is an impact in uh, the growth of seeds and a decrease in water supply. Where there's no water, there's no life. So the uh, Central America Pacific area has been impacted highly by the heat wave that we are currently experiencing. And as a result, we see a lot of social unrest that is going to generate more migration problems. So climate change is here and is having an impact not only in the eco-social systems and eco-environmental systems. And we are going to see a readaptation of the ecological systems. We are going to see new diseases, a new uh, epidemiological profiles. So we can see that climate change has a severe impact and it's going to affect the, reg the regional impact. Costa Rica is a country of uh, transit for migrants. We noticed that with the first wave of migrants from Haiti that uh, went from Brazil up to the United States. And secondly, we experienced this in the past with the Venezuelan migration. Why is this important? Because while they are uh, transit Costa Rica, Costa Rica state has to give them some health services. Ch children and young people have to have coverage as well as pregnant women. The Costa Rica state have to provide these services. Therefore, social security has a a new instrument. It's an agreement to ensure migrant people in Costa Rica. So we have a, a special fund from Costa Rica and the ACNUR. And it's a very important figure. But this is the third year where we have signed this agreement and through the ACNUR we provide economic resources so the Costa Rican Social Security Fund can provide uh, for health care to migrants that are transit Costa Rica or if they need some health care in the refugee centers in the region. The ACNUR or the UNHCR. Uh, so uh, it's important to consider that migrants are highly vulnerable before the Costa Rican social security because we depend highly on the formalization degree of jobs. And unfortunately, unfortunately, in Costa Rica, we have a we have a lot of people that are working informally, not for because they want to, because they have been vulnerable. And besides, we are speaking about migrants that have health needs. And if Costa Rica wouldn't have that agreement with the UNHCR, we would have seen more tax pressure to provide care to all these migrants. So for me, the third challenge 
currently is about this, how to provide enough resources to social security in Costa Rica before these challenges like climate change, regional political uh, conflicts besa besides the social unrest that we see uh, and all the wars in Palestine and all the uh, problematic situations in other parts of the world. So I think that this could be an answer to the migration needs that we have in the region. We need to explore and to strengthen them even more. So we need to think that migration, it's a highly vulnerable population for the social security in Costa Rica. I am about to wrap up. These are the three main challenges that we are facing in Costa Rica. Tomorrow, we are going to have another conference and we are going to be talking about the current challenges for social security and its relevance for social peace with two main factors and two members of the uh, Social Security Fund and the former chair of the Social Security Fund in Costa Rica. So we invite you to be part of this debate. I am going to be part of that debate, but addressing different challenges. And uh, to wrap up, I am going to share with you scientific diplomacy in a nutshell. What we are looking for in this uh, Center for Development and Center for the Peace, we would like to join into other um, uh, networks of uh, research and scientific cooperation. We would like to have a comparison uh, research. Last year, there was a conference about if uh, we need to blame informality for this social crisis. I attended that conference. I was very interested. However, I think that its applicability to the Costa Rican system is not uh, viable because the public policy depends on the job market. So this is just food for thought. We need to look for opportunities to publish papers, and we are interested in having exchanges for scientific academics. Uh, for PhD students or to share different experiences. Currently, in our line of research, we have addressed different items that we have developed. First, uh, the price with, of medication, because Costa Rica, I think, has the highest price of medications in Latin America. So we are trying to provide some opportunities and alternatives to decrease the price. So we are very in, in interested in both, both the cost and accessibility. And the national system for public policies of cares has to be addressing uh, the care for children, young people, and old people. And there is another life of research, old elderly people and uh, retired people. Uh, Dr. Perez Rodriguez is going to be talking about that. And we would like to invite you to be with us in the first Inter-American uh, Conference in Costa Rica from July 15 to 17 about basic universal income, because we are considering that maybe this is a new way for social security. This is going to be my presentation in the Congress. I am inviting you. We are uh, looking forward to see you there. And we have published different scientific papers, but other papers re uh, related with the job market, social security, insurance, health insurance, and uh, retirement insurance. So be in touch with us. And if you are interested in these different lives, lines of research, you can be in touch with me. Uh, we can welcome you in Costa Rica and we can have some remote meetings. I'm about to wrap up and some general conclusions. I think that there is a close relationship between the tax as wage and social policies. We have financing conditions that are unrelated from the current 
job market, we have assigned responsibilities of economic content that increase the debt. And there is a struggle between fiscal consolidation and state debt. The state has two main challenges that they cannot face at the same time. So in the last two administration, Carlos Alvarado's administration and Hugo Chavez has uh, focus on consolidating the fiscal debt and not the state debt. And I don't have an answer for this question, but I think that we need to challenge the architecture of the current uh, contribution system in Costa Rica because it's not considering the realities of the job in Costa Rica. Thank you for your attention. And if you wish, you can be in touch with me with my email, avadillas at uned.ac.cr or my social media. Andre J. Badilla Solano. Thank you all for this opportunity to share the work that we are doing in Costa Rica. I am going to be here if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andre, for a great presentation. I think it was a very comprehensive glance about the challenges. And after this presentation at noon, we are going to have some dialogues about climate change that is of your interest. And tomorrow we are going to talk about the rights of social security. And the Fund of Costa Rica is going to talk about the agreement that they have with the UNHCR or ACNUR. In Zoom, I see that Rafael Nieva raised his hand. Fair, can you help us? Rafael, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Rafael? Well, there are a couple of questions in the social media. And we will back to you, Rafael. Andre, uh, regarding automation, can you elaborate on the problems for automation specifically? What are the economic or the economical sectors where we are going to see the impacts of this phenomenon? Another question, from your perspective, we don't know if there is an analysis about what we are going to do with the population that is going to be displaced by this automation, how to reinsert them in the job sector, uh, people that is going to be are going to be replaced by AI. You have the floor. Thank you so much. As a recap, automation and the most uh, impacted economic sectors and uh, alternatives for job displacement? Yes. I am going to start with the second question uh, uh, and I am going to wrap up with the first one. Sorry for that. Last year, I gave a conference entitled uh, Universal uh, Income, AI and Robots. And since then, I am questioning if universal income could become a tool for social security. And secondly, if this could be an option to contain adverse events like displacement or transition for job losses, a market, job market transportation as a result of uh, AI, automation, machine learning. Why uh, universal income could become an alternative? Well, maybe because it ensures a floor for well-being and minimum levels of consumption. So in the current productive scheme that highly depends on consumption will allow us that the industry that is automated could maintain current levels for economic growth and consumption by ensuring a universal basic income for all the population, but also because the UBI will be 
consumption capabilities to populations that historically didn't have the UBI. It is going to have a positive impact in vulnerable uh, population like uh, number one or number two because they have a lot of needs and with this ubi the new income that is going to become a consumption so it's going to have a multiply a multiplying effect in consumption so it could be an alternative for the transition process towards new sources of employment what are going to be the productive sectors or the economic sectors that are going to be more impacted by this i have a slide but it's not with me now if you give me just a moment, I will uh, present that to you. And this is about that. What, which are the employments that are going to be more impacted by job automation? Just give me just one second. Well, you can see this slide. This is the percentage of employment exposed to automation in the U.S. The supporting staff clerks has a risk of 46% to be displaced by AI. Secondly, legal works, engineers, architectures, 37%, social services, 33% percent compute mathematics 29 percent how can we read this uh, slide labor manual labors like cleaning maintenance janitoring construction are the ones that have minor risk for displacement by ai while works like social security labors others have higher risk of displacement so in other words, you won't need five lawyers when you can have one doctor in law and an AI to assist them. So what we are experiencing or seeing is that high specialization that has generated so many employments will be replaced by AI. I believe this is the answer to both questions, I guess. Yes. We have a couple of minutes. So we have another question regarding scientific diplomacy. From your perspective, what do you believe could be the benefits or problems of the so-called scientific diplomacy as part of this new diplomacy scenario? And regarding research, how can this tackle the common today problems? in the Costa Rican context. And personally, I would like to ask you if we can talk about uh, social security diplomacy beyond science. Yes, I love the term, social security diplomacy. I love it because it seems like compared policy allow us to learn lessons without taking bitter pills. So we are living in a region that's experiencing job market transformation. And the answer won't go from, won't be sourced by a researcher in Brazil, Uruguay, or Costa Rica. Scientific diplomacy is just that. It is a tool for cooperation that allows to experience, to share experiences and to add efforts to try to reach the solutions and scientific research programs that allow to explain and predict. But this scientific diplomacy cannot be by the academic corporations. Open access needs to lead the way so that we can have open access to all the region and data exchange. I believe you are providing an innovating focus where we can talk about uh, social security diplomacy which will allow us to study restudy and propose new 
initiatives. And for an instance, you had activities about informality and its impact on social security. And I love the activity of the last year because it was really close to what we were doing regarding the job market impact and the informality in Costa Rica or the main indicators seem to show that it does have an impact on the Costa Rican social security and it's a deep impact. So it seems like the Costa Rican data make us question the validity of this affirmation as a generalizing capacity to all social security because it has its particularities. The way to contribute is different. We are more similar in our social security to other regions in Central America. So it seems to me like it makes it richer and it allows us to access problems. One problem is funding and work equipment that's necessary. I am part of a work team of three or people. So in positive, we are few, but we are brave. And we suit up and try to provide to the table. But when we work on greater numbers, we can provide more. And that's the importance on the social security diplomacy in this moment. Sorry if I went overboard. No, 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 thank you. I believe that we had another question, but the person is not online anymore. But with no more questions here or on the digital platforms, I believe this is all of the questions. And we would like to thank you for your time and the participation of you, our most recent member. And I believe it is a constant dynamic effort we are making. And we wish you the best of luck for your activities that you are carrying in the Social Security Week. And in the name of the Secretary General, we say thank you and congratulate you for your activities. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you. Hopefully, we'll see you soon. Also, to our audience, we'll be back at noon to talk about social security and climate change, both in Zoom and Social media will have the background image and we'll see you at noon.